our Bacher with us today. Inga is a retired chemist. She worked for 38 years in medical research and clinical work. She is the author of six books pu published in nine languages. She received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Long Island University in New York. She is an Ellis Island Medal of Honor winner with, along with John Glenn and Hillary Clinton. She has three major awards from Germany, including one from the president. She is the subject of many documentary films and an honorary member of Blackfeet Nation of Montana. So if everyone could welcome Inga. afternoon. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for inviting me. Everybody, thank you, thank you from my heart. I brought you a gift from New York, snow. <laughs> I just missed the snow. Two weeks ago, I was in Scotland where I was a keynote speaker for International Holocaust Day, and I missed it. So now I said, okay, let somebody else have it. All right. Uh, yeah, I have to put it to my mouth. I know. Okay, I'll try my best. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a very serious subject, the Holocaust. I know you've heard the word. Um, I meet a lot of people and I ask them, do you know what the word Holocaust means? What is it? In fact, there was a film the other day on television from Penn State the students were asked, what is Holocaust? One girl said, is it a holiday? It's already over 70 years ago, and we are forgetting what happened. The word Holocaust means complete destruction by fire, when 11 million innocent people were killed. A better word would be slaughtered. Who were those people? They were uh, six million Jews. Of course, Hitler hated the Jews very much. He wanted to kill every single one in this world. Among them were one and a half million children. And those three million children's eyes still haunt me because their story was mine and mine was theirs. But who were the five million others? They were human beings too deserved the right to live. They were gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, people with mental, physical problems, different sexual orientation, some clergy, and also some Poles. And all deserved the right to live. Anybody who was against Hitler, he wanted killed. Can everybody hear me? It's OK? Yes, you hear me good? Good. I just have to hold it very close. I forget sometimes. Now, the period we're talking about is 1938 to 1945. Some people say it really started 33, but that's a little bit early. I would say from 38 to 45. Now, we have also some young people here. And you're probably thinking, oh, that old lady up there. Well, I was just told they don't believe how old I am. Well, I'll tell you later. I have proof, passport. <laughs> and you think, well, yeah, this happened so many years. Why do we have to learn about this? Why? Because had Hitler succeeded, many of you would not be sitting here. Because who would have been the next group? And I just was in Scotland, where I was a keynote speaker for International Holocaust Day. And the topic was, don't stand by. And my co-person was somebody who worked in the Sudan. He was in charge by the United Nations of the Sudan. And when the genocides occurred in Rwanda. So we said over 70 years ago, never again. But it has been again and again and again, very sadly. What have we learned? Almost nothing. But if we don't learn about the past, perhaps it could even be still worse. 
Now, I want to take you on a journey through my first 10 years of life living in Nazi Germany, actually Europe, because it was not only Germany, and a little bit afterwards what happened. And so let's pack our bags and we're going on a journey in pictures. I, is this too um, light in here? Maybe, can you see it? Okay, first picture. Where, oh, my clicker lady. Thank you, by the way, Caitlin. Without Caitlin, the show doesn't go on. Thank you. All right. I was born on December 31, 1934. You don't have to take out your calculators. I'm 81 years young. I just turned 81 in December. Yes, young. Don't say old. Thank you. And of course, I can hide my age with Clairol. Everybody can do everything with Clairol. So thank you, Clairol. In this little village of Kippenheim, uh, in southwestern Germany, very close to the French-Swiss border. Beautiful little village, 2,000 people, 60 Jewish families. And we lived very happily together, wall to wall, houses next to each other. And uh, Jewish people lived in this little village for more than 200 years. My family was there more than 200 years. In Germany, Jews lived way over 1,000 years. And especially for you young people, when we talk about being Jewish, what does it mean? I'm not going to ask, I'm not, I don't intend to get an answer. It is a religion, not a race. Hitler said we are a race. We're not. There are black Jews. I was in a black synagogue in New York. Uh, there are Chinese Jews, Indian Jews. I was in India. I went to an Indian synagogue. So we are not a race. We are a people, yes, but different uh, ethnic backgrounds. And it's a religion, not a race. Very important to know that. Here's my little village. It still looks exactly the way you see it here. Not too much has changed. And I was the last Jewish child born in this village. Next. Here's the house I'm born in, still standing, over 200 years old. And there was no hospital. So I was born at home. There was a hospital in another town, but my father said she has to be born in the same house that I was born. And when you look on the second floor, those two windows, that's the room I'm born in, my parents' bedroom. And you always think that all doctors are Jewish. Well, the doctor who delivered me wasn't Jewish. Not only that, he already belonged to the Nazi party. And actually, the SS, the stormtroopers even. And it was a strange situation. He took very good care of his Jewish patients. Very good care. Can't say one bad word about him. Later on, he did some terrible things uh, with the euthanasia program, killing people with mental, physical difficulties. And he was in jail for many, many years. So perhaps there's a Jekyll and Hyde in all of us. Next. My father was a textile merchant. Uh, we were middle class. We weren't millionaires. We were very comfortable. And daddy already had a car. I remained an only child, spoiled. And when my father came to court my mother, he came with this bright, black, shiny car. And that was an important thing for a girl in those days, because not too many bows had cars. And when he came to propose, of course she would say yes. I don't know, did she marry the car or my daddy? <laughs> but anyway, they were married 54 happy years before my father passed away. And of course she would show off to her girlfriends, my beau has a car. Fine. And he always had a car. That was very important. Next. Even if it was a used car. My daddy was also a soldier in World War I. We were totally um, assimilated into the German society. Uh, the Christians went to their church on Sunday, and we went on Saturday. It was an ortho modern Orthodox community. 
um, a little bit isolated, I would say, yet we were together with the whole group as well. We just uh, kept our own um, holidays, so forth. We fought in the wars. My father was a soldier, as I told you, in World War I. He was wounded quite badly and received the Iron Cross for his wounds. He never would be able to raise his right arm. Uh, and uh, he received, as I told you, the Iron Cross. Now, a uh, highly decorated, that's a very high decoration like the Purple Heart in America. My great-grandmother had 14 children. She had four sons in World War I. Two died for Germany. Later on, they killed some of the others. So you see, we were not cowards. We fought right along. We considered ourselves Germans uh, with the Jewish religion. Next. Here I am in my sandbox, perhaps doing my first experiments to become a great scientist. <laughs> I baked wonderful sand uh, cakes, wonderful. Maybe dreaming already to become a Mary Curie or an Albert Einstein. I'm very serious here. It could have been, but it didn't happen that way. But I did work 38 years in medical research and clinical work, and I'm retired very happily. Next, a trip to the Black Forest, which was very nearby. And I'm wearing the traditional German dress, the dirndl dress. When you go to a German restaurant, you see the waitress is also wearing the, the puffy sleeves and the aprons. And my parents dressed me like that. I was a German little girl. Not only that, they gave me a very German name, Inga. It was very popular, not Inga, it's Inge pronounced correctly, I-N-G-E. And there were derivatives, Ingeborg, Ingemar, Ing, uh, whatever, whatever you could make Ingrid with, out of this uh, name. Um, it was sort of a Swedish name, but the Germans used it very much. And later on, when I went to school, when the teacher said, Inge, stand up, almost all the girls would stand up. <laughs> You can tell how old a person is uh, by the name. When I go to Germany today, and I go very often to Germany, my German is still very good. I can speak it, and I can write it. And I ask them, do you have a grandmother whose name is Inga? And they also, they raise their hand, so I know. In the 30s, everybody had the name Inga. Next. Here I am in front of my favorite place, a little tower. It has a story. On my house, there was a plaque. I never really realized what it meant, only later, that a very famous person was born in the same house, a tailor. He went to England, and he was taken in by a tame, uh, German tailor, and they made all the clothes for the aristocracy, and I was told even those bear hats, the black uh, bear hats, that they were sewing them, and uh, in fact, they said he designed it, which I doubt, Probably it was an older situation. He became very rich, came back to Germany, to Kippenheim, and gave bread to the poor on his name day. He did set up a hospital, which was no longer in existence when I was born. He set up an orphanage in the Black Forest, which is now used as a school. And he did a lot of really good things. And to honor him, he was knighted. And they set up this tower um, to honor him as well. And it was my favorite place. Now, they put a plaque on the house, as I told you. This is the birth house of, of, of uh, the Honorable um, Georg Stutz von Kippenheim. And to it's still there, all those years. And today, there's a plaque right next to his that I was also born in this house. So I feel quite good. The house has really good karma. And I'm still good friends with the people who own it today. It's a very nice house still. It's 200, more than 200 years old. Next. The time is now 1938, when everything changed. It was the time for Crystal Night, the first major pogrom riot against the Jewish people in modern times, in Austria and in Germany. My grandparents, my mother's parents, lived about 200 miles away, came to visit us often. I went to see them there. 
and my other grandparents I never knew because they had died before my father got married. So here we are, quite happy, the last happy picture of the whole family together. My parents in the back, my grandparents, and you see, my grandfather has his head covered. We were an Orthodox family, and Orthodox boys and men should keep their head covered to honor God. Now, I know Christians take off their heads, except the Pope and the Cardinals, and they stole that from us. It's the, the skull cap. So my father, grandfather had a fancy one. And there's something very special here. I hold my doll, Marlene. Now, she would be the only object that would survive my three years of incarceration. And I brought her to America. She is now in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., quite important. They don't show her very often. She's quite brittle. And I found out much later, I showed some of these pictures in Germany, and one of the people said, you know, your doll is famous. I said, well, for me, she's wonderful. I named her actually after the famous movie star, Marlene Dietrich. My mother loved movie stars, and she had an album. And my doll had blonde hair and blue eyes. I said, Mommy, who's that? I couldn't read yet. And that's Marlene Dietrich. And for those who don't know her, she's sort of a Britney Spears sex pot, you see. <laughs> and, but she was much smarter. She was. Don't put that on television. I'll get sued, God forbid. But she was. She was really quite an intelligent woman, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, and so forth. So I named her Marlene. Everybody knows that. But the lady who saw that picture said to me, you know, this doll's name was actually Inga. And she was made for the 1936 Olympics, the Hitler Olympics. Had a special hairdo, Olympic role. Never knew about that either till much later. I went actually to the factory. They gave me a new Inga doll. And she was the mo one of the most popular models that they sold. There was a Barbara and Erica. And my grandmother, of course, she had one uh, grandchild. Uh, she gave the Inga doll. We never knew that. My mother never knew that either before she died. So that's the Inga doll. But I named her Marlene. Next. Here was our beautiful synagogue. <clears throat> and November 9th and 10th was this major riot in Kippenheim. It happened on November 10th. Grandpa went to the synagogue in the morning to say his morning prayers, was arrested, and sent to the Dachau concentration camp. All boys from the age of 16 on and men in Germany and in Austria were arrested, sent to concentration camps. In our area, it was Dachau. Some others was Buchenwald. I was not even four years old at that time. It was just before my fourth birthday, but I remember it as if it happened yesterday. And the uh, windows of the houses, the Jewish houses, were broken. I remember standing in the living room with my mother and my grandmother, glass all over the floor, and one hoodlum uh, saw the chandelier still hanging, and he yelled, oh, we have to get that one. He threw a big rock through the broken window, and then we were hiding in the backyard shed. Now, all synagogues were either burned to the ground or desecrated very badly. They started to burn our synagogue, but there were Christian houses nearby, and they stopped that, uh, because all the other Christian houses would go up in flame too, but they desecrated the building extremely badly. And of course, all the men were gone. They only in the village were children, and women left. Next. And this is the picture of the inside of the synagogue. And for those, I mean, here we are in, on the, west, uh, the East Coast. Now, when I go to Nebraska or Indiana, which I will do next week, they don't really know much about Jewish people. Of course, we have a cantor and a rabbi. Very important uh, to have a good cantor, because most of our prayers are sung. In our case, we did not have a um, rabbi. Uh, only a cantor, but he served as both. And here was our beautiful synagogue before its destruction. 
Next. And this is a piece how it looked after its destruction. We got that picture some years ago. Somebody kept it up in the attic somewhere, in the shoebox probably. And before dying, he decided to give it to us. That was your synagogue, and it was. But what's interesting is the bystanders. Ailey Wiesel, the Nobel Prize winner, says, if you're only <clears throat> a bystander, uh, you're equally guilty to the people who are doing it, doing the actual deed. Hold on. a little girl watching. Now, of course, I can't blame her for standing there. They were curious to look. What's going on? Next. Next. For many years, the synagogue looked like this. It was even more damaged even after the war because it was in very bad state. I took that picture the first time I went back to Germany in 1966. And it was used as a storage area for pig food. And you know we're not supposed to eat pork. It's forbidden. And many, many years it stood like that. An eyesore. Next. Today it has been rebuilt as it looked uh, in the beginning from the outside. The inside you can still see the scars. Something happened here. And it is used... The building is used as a cultural house, uh, not only for Jewish things. It's very active. Um, there are concerts there. I've spoken there many times. And I will say the two most beautiful buildings in Kippenheim are the synagogue, which is smack in the middle of the village, in the middle, and the city hall. One thing is different. You have the tablets on top. No Hebrew lettering. It is no longer a holy place. It is a symbol that once good Jewish people lived together with us. And it's a very, very active, popular place. I've spoken there many times. Next. Now, all the men are in Dachau. We didn't know even where they were. We thought, God forbid, something terrible happened because one of the policemen came to our house and gave my mother a basket full of their ties and belts. And she asked him, what happened to them? He said, well, I don't know, and I don't care. We were nothing to them. Finally, a few weeks later, they did permit most of these people to come home again. And of course, they told the terrible stories what happened there. Now, they had to give up their clothes and wear those blue and white striped prison uniforms, stand at attention in the bitter cold, it's quite cold in that area near Munich, uh, for hours and hours. And if somebody even wanted to blow their nose, they were hosed down with ice cold water. And that happened to my father a few times. They said, oh, you can throw away your iron cross. It doesn't mean a thing. You are just a dirty Jew. And until then, we really did not want to leave Germany. It's very hard, you know, to, today you think about a backseat uh, driver, why didn't you just leave? Well, I'm going to ask you, how would you leave your homes that you worked for and all of a sudden you have to leave? It's very difficult. You Jews lived in Germany way over a thousand years and it didn't come to such an end like now. Uh, in those years. Uh, yes, there were pogroms, there were riots and things, but not to that extent. And we had not planned to leave, neither did my grandfather. And it was time to leave, certainly, and they, after hearing these dreadful stories, and my father, it's time to leave. Uh, I was now in a, one of those camps. Who knows what's going to happen to to us? Uh, but the doors to the free world were closing very rapidly. Um, we had a number to come to America, for instance. Maybe it would have taken 10 years to come here. Roosevelt didn't want us. Nobody wanted us. The doors were closed. But we sold a house at a very cheap price and still hoping to get out 
and moved in with my grandparents, who were about 200 miles away, in an even smaller village called Jedenhausen. Today is a bigger one, uh, Göppingen, they're together. The town is between Stuttgart, the capital of Württemberg, and Ulm. Ulm is where Albert Einstein was born. And here Jews lived also for more than 200 years, a village of about 1,000 people. At one time, it was 40% Jewish. But around 1850, the Jews left to go to America, or they went to the bigger cities, except my branch of the family. They were the only Jewish family left. And I have to tell you that we were treated with great respect for the most part. I had many friends there, all Christian. Some of them I still have today. We would march up and down this hill, which was at one time the Jewish street. Of course, later on, they mixed up and lived together. At one time, they had to live separate. And we were singing the songs of the day, which were many times Nazi songs. We didn't even know. And when you look on the left side, towards the end of the hill, there was a building, a little bakery. That bakery belonged to Albert Einstein's aunt and uncle. Name was Kutch. And I found that out much, much later. And most likely, Albert went to see his aunt and uncle. So he marched up and down that street as well. And that's one of the things I'm very sorry I missed. Because Albert Einstein and Mary Curie, those were my heroes. I wanted to become a scientist. I was a nerdy kid, kind of. Uh, I'd lost a lot of school. And uh, so I was the only child who was transported out of uh, Stuttgart for the whole state who returned. And I missed that opportunity, unfortunately, to meet him. I'm still sorry about that. I know he would have uh, invited me. I mean, Princeton is not that far from New York City, where I now live. I missed it. Next. My grandfather was a cattle dealer, as were many Jews in villages in Germany. And those are my grandparents. The house is still standing. In fact, it has been renovated. I'm very anxious to see it. And I will see it in a few weeks. And the cows, he would have like two, three cows in the stable, was in the house. I know it's kind of hard for you to believe that, but they had to be kept warm, and that's how it was. So the black door was the stable. The cows were in there. And this was the uh, doorway to go up to the living quarters. And even to this day, I'm a country girl. I grew up with cows and, and, and chickens, loved it, loved it. I was in Montana some uh, about two years ago, uh, and um, uh, they had 1,400 black Angus. And I told the lady, this big ranch owner, I want to kiss all of them. Well, they ran away, unfortunately. <laughs> they missed something good. Next. Here's my best friend, Elizabeth, whom I'm still friends with today. She is now a widow, but we're in touch. Christmas, we call each other up, birthdays. And of course, my doll is always with me. I brought her to America, too. Uh, when I got off the boat, there was Marlene in my arm. Next. Grandpa died soon after Crystal Night in May of 39. He couldn't believe his beloved Germany had forsaken him. He bought, died of a broken heart, both physically and spiritually. And he's the last Jew to be buried in the Jewish cemetery in this little village. And you see all the these stones, are the monuments are erect, except my grandpa's. We gave him only a plate lying down. Because at that time, the Jewish cemeteries were being desecrated, and we did not want anything to happen to his grave. And it didn't, thank God. Again, I'm in my dirndl dress. Next. Now, these pictures you're about to see are extremely rare. It's about the deportation from my hometown in the state of Baden. Baden and Württemberg, where my mother was born, they were born in two different states. And I would say they were a mixed marriage, you know, one, and those two states hated each other. Today they are together. Baden Württemberg is one state, very prosperous. That's where you have the Mercedes cars made there, Mercedes Benz in Stuttgart, so forth. It's one state. And in Baden, all the Jews were deported 
to a place in the north near the Spanish-French border in the Basque country called Gurs, G-U-R-S. And from there, most of them were sent uh, to Rivsal, Trancy, Auschwitz. That was the route. So there was nobody left. And had we still stayed there, we would have been deported at that time too. But at this time, we're still safe. Somebody had these very rare pictures of the actual deportation. And most of these people were from my family. And here you have also like second cousins. Uh, they did survive. They went by way of Morocco. They had some kind of bogus ticket, and they did come to America. And the little boy in the end, he's today, he's still alive. He's four years older than I am, still working in the Library of Congress in the German section. He got himself a PhD. What's interesting here is uh, the girl. Now, there are many pictures about deportations in Poland where you had uh, over three million Jews. In Germany, even at the height, there were no more than a f about a half a million. That's all. People always say, millions, millions. No, 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 no. Half a million. That's it. And so these pictures uh, are extremely uh, important. We asked that lady. She's still alive, I found out. And we asked her, well, what did you think as your friends are being taken away? I just wanted to look. The bystanders. Next. They gave them very little time to pack up, just maybe a half an hour, an hour. So take whatever you can and, and, and leave. Leave your house behind. It's no longer yours. This was also a cousin of ours. He did not make it. Next. They're a little grainy, but we're very happy to have those pictures. Here, the whole town is watching. It was also agricultural town. Yep, even a cow is there. And the old lady, look how high she has to step up. Next. And we know who's um, uh, the daughter we know, and she said, we told her, that was your father. Impossible. Even though we know the back, it was the father. And she said, can't be. He would never travel with a suitcase. Look, it's all raggedy. He has a rope around it. But they gave him so little time to pack up. They just took something. He did not make it. He died in Auschwitz. Next. 1941, we're still safe. And it was time to go to school. But the Jewish children were not allowed to go to school with the Christians. There was only one school for the whole state in Stuttgart, the capital of Württemberg. I had to get special travel permission papers to go. And it was very quite far from the village. In the beginning, my father had permission to take me. He took a bicycle. We were not allowed to ride on the bus. And then on the train to Stuttgart, took about an hour. Today's about a half an hour. And then to the school. Eventually, my parents had to do some slave labor. And I took that trip all by myself as a six-year-old. When I think about it, I mean, would you let a six-year-old go in the subway in New York today? No. I had to do it. And I wanted to go to school. So this was the Jewish school. Next. Next. One of the classes. Next. And then it became even more difficult. We had to wear the yellow Star of David branded. The stars came on a yellow sheet, very bad cloth with the word Yud and Hebrew-like letters. And they came in different uh, variations in French, Juif, and Dutch, Yod. That came a little later. In Austria and Hungary, they came in 1941 in the fall. And I have my original star here. You had to, from the age of six, you had to wear that star sewn on over your clothes on the outside uh, and wear it. So here, this is my actual star. And you can see there are threads on it. Uh, my mother put a backing on it that you could sew. It wasn't good cloth. We ripped those stars off on May 8, 1945, when we were liberated from the terrorism concentration camp. So here is how it looked. 
six year oh the other side excuse me I had it the opposite side here you there you with the thread you can see it here better and my father said to me try to sit in such a way on the train try to lean against the left window that nobody can see you because there were always some nasty boys and girls who would yell at me and heckle me you dirty Jew I was as clean as they I only remember one good thing that happened next please here's about what I looked like in those days there was a woman who passed me by as she went out the door Christian woman and as she went she put a brown paper bag probably her lunch for the day next to me now, I have never forgotten that good lady. She saw I was Jewish. She saw the star. She wanted to do something. I have two heroes in my life during that time. She was one of them. At the end, I will tell you the second one. Now, had more people done at least something, uh, maybe this tragedy wouldn't have gone as far as it did. And I hope she's looking down from heaven to see me after more close to 70 years. I remember, actually it's more than 70 years, this good woman who would have, she even gave her lunch to me uh, to do something. She had a good heart and and I will never forget her. Wherever I speak, whether it was in Scotland or in, in Mexico, I spoke recently to in Germany, that woman, anonymous, never knew her name, but she will never, never be forgotten until I take my last breath. Next. Now, the transports to the camps began in that part of Germany in 41, in the winter and school closed. Before I'd finished my first grade, I had six months of schooling, never finished my first grade. Altogether, I lost eight years of schooling in my life, but I did graduate from college and high school. That was the only thing. And we had to leave the house. We still owned my grandparents' house. We were in the transport with our number and my grandmother as well. And my father wrote a letter to the Gestapo, the secret police, that he is a disabled war veteran. Somehow it worked, and we tried very hard for my grandmother. Couldn't do it. And all these people, the school closed, and mostly all the children and uh, all the people in that area were sent to a place in Latvia called Riga. They were sent to the forest and shot. And I went to that place a few years ago. I wanted to say goodbye to my grandmother. And I took the German version of the book, I'm a star, ich bin ein Stern. And I wrote her a note. And they have plaques when you walk in, where they came from, Stuttgart, Nuremberg, wherever. And then you walk up a hill. And there's one mass grave after another. I walked maybe till two of them, all cement around it, no names, nothing at least 52, so between 50,000 and maybe even more than that, were buried in that cemetery, just one of them. There were many, 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 and that was in Latvia. And for all intents and purposes, I should have been in one of those graves. And I wrote her note, I put a candle on a yacht site, you know, a memorial candle on the plaque where it says Stuttgart, she has no grave. I wrote her note, Liebe Oma, ich werde dich nie vergessen. Dearest Granny, I shall never forget you. I wrote it in German because I felt if she looks down from above, she wouldn't understand the English. So I wrote in German. That's how we think. So, and then we had to leave the house. We were sent in the neighboring bigger town into Jewish houses from the people who were still left, not uh, transported. Transport always had over a thousand people. And here were still some children alive, very few at this time. And just as a small example, one of these would make it out of that whole little group, the girl with the striped hat. That's me in front of you. All these children were killed in Poland. Next. Then the papers came again. 
and you can come later. I have a copy, a better copy down here, that the Holocaust Museum in Washington copied. They want the original thing. It's very rare to have your order for transport, which is a death sentence, to still have it. There were three pages, but on both sides, or six pages altogether, what you can take along, what not. But you cannot bring any doctor's note to get out of the uh, transport. And our transport had about 1,200 people, and I was the youngest in that transport. I was seven years old. They told you you should have metal dishes, cans like, like army uh, dishes, um, no knives, no scissors. You could take this and that along, but they would take it away anyway. They wanted you to believe you will see your luggage again. Of course, we didn't. And we were... Uh, sent to uh, gathering places. In our town, it was a school, gymnasium. To, there would be 50 here, another town, another 50, to make up close to 1,200 people in the main gathering place. My number was actually Roman numeral 13-1-408. I never forget it. And I did play it with Lotto once. I didn't get it, but it's OK. It was my lucky number. Next. And these pictures were drawn for my first book, I'm a Star, which is now quite popular. It's considered a classic. And uh, I wrote the poems first, and then I wrote a book about it. I always wanted to write a book about my life. And I was wearing a little pin, a Dutch boy pin. And as we were in this school gymnasium, there were tables like this set up open everything. And he saw that pin. He ripped it off me. And he said, oh, you won't need this where you're going in the Swabian dialect. Do post this net. We'll do engage. I know where I'm going. I'm seven years old. Then he saw my doll on my arm. He ripped it from me. And I made a big fuss. And he looked inside a hollow body. She was hollow. I wasn't hiding anything. And somehow uh, he gave me back my doll. And that's why she's still uh, with me in the museum, actually. Next. And this was picture was actually a little film that they made of my grandmother's transport. They wanted to show the world, oh, we do things very systematically, you know, German way. Every I has to be dotted. And, but only a few months later, we were in the same two halls waiting for the train. Something is interesting here. When you look up here, when you go straight up this way, you see a woman bend over a little bit. It looks like my grandmother. I can't swear to it, but it could be her last picture. But I cannot, uh, I enlarged the picture. These are stills from an actual film uh, that's shown still, on maybe a minute film in the Holocaust Museum next to the boxcar. It goes constantly about deportations. This was the uh, transport from Stuttgart. I cannot identify her 100%. Next. But we were lying in the same way on the floor waiting for the train to come. In the morning, get our little food. Next. And then in Germany, everybody had an ID. Ours had a J on it. Jude, Jew. And they stamped on it, umgesiedelt, resettled, 22nd of August, 42. Now, you have a lot of Holocaust deniers today say, this never happened. You even have somebody saying, oh, those ovens in Auschwitz baked bread. I don't think you would like to taste that bread. I've visited Auschwitz in my camp where I was many times. And there's so much proof. How can some idiots talk so stupid? But people are, some people are too stupid. They want to rewrite history. But the history is here. It cannot be changed by anybody, even in a thousand years. And I hope they will not do so, because this was real. There are enough documents around, enough books, enough films, enough data. Next. From here, we were sent on a train. It was not a boxcar train yet, a regular train, very crowded. You couldn't leave it for two days. And we arrive in a town called Bolshevitz in Czechoslovakia. Today it's called the Czech Republic. We didn't even know where we were. And we had a lot of old people on the train. We were told, get off, leave everything behind except your metal dishes. 
a blanket, little duffel bag. Of course, I kept my doll. Uh, and we were told to march about uh, two kilometers into the camp. We're marching, and some of the old people couldn't march. We're laying already by the wayside next. Marching, and my parents put me between them because they were whipping us, so they wanted to protect me from the blows. Next watching into the camp. It happened in broad daylight, not in the middle of the night. People saw us. I got this picture from an archive. Somebody took this, saw it as we're marching in, and nobody said a word. They had no uh, feelings for what was going to happen to those people. They didn't see them again. Nobody cared. The world didn't care. Next. Marching into the camp. Next. And we arrive in an actual little town, army garrison town, called Theresienstadt or Terrazin. And it was one of the hoaxes of World War II. It was an actual town built by Emperor Joseph II in memory of his mother, Teresa. It was a place where you put the intelligentsia of Europe the highly decorated war veterans, the best musicians, the best doctors, the best artists, put them in one place, sealed them off, and periodically sent them to the east where the death uh, uh, camps were and killed them. If you didn't die there of malnutrition and hunger and disease, um, you were sent out. And the transports went periodically. Eichmann, who was in charge, of the whole machinery. He came quite a few times. I saw him there. And whenever he came, more transports out. And they were, um, you never knew what they wanted. At one time, uh, uh, anybody or then disabled war veterans, so forth. It didn't matter. Whatever it was, they had to put a list together of about 1,200 people and send them out. And was totally sealed off by brick walls, brick barracks, barbed wire, and wooden fences. Next. And we lived, when we came, in one of those stone barracks, even higher, under the roof, in the attic. Thousands of people walking around. It was hot. It was August. And I remember I saw some sheets on the ground. I never saw a dead body before. I lifted it, and there were dead bodies. People died like flies. Some people committed suicide. My father actually saved one man. He was already hanging out the dormer window. He pulled him back and he promised him You're not going, he's not going to do it again. Next day, he was dead in the courtyard. Maybe he was better off that way because he definitely would have had a very sad ending, even worse than what he did to himself. We pumped our water from polluted wells, so many people got dysentery and typhus. Next. And these are the walls surrounding us with moats. It was a run-down little actual town. Next. And soon after my arrival, there was an um, epidemic of scarlet fever, and most of the children had scarlet fever. On the ground, we were lying there on the cement floor, uh, with just a blanket and nothing much else. And they set up uh, some rooms for the sick children, two children in every bed. We couldn't see our parents for months <clears throat> until we felt better. There was no, we had good doctors and nurses, but they couldn't do very much for us. Finally, I was released close to my eighth birthday, and I joined my parents. Now, most men, women, and children had to live separate. They could still see each other. But the disabled war veterans um, were, were allowed to live together, uh, of course, in very primitive conditions, in uh, double, triple deck bunk beds, uh, no chair, no table, nothing, just like the other people. Next. And they were terrible old houses run down. Mice, rats, fleas, and bed bugs. Those were constant companions. Uh, the bathrooms were latrines, one for men, one for women. Cold in the summer, hot in the winter. And believe me, when you have dysentery, uh, it's very hard to run quite maybe a block to go to your latrine. So absolutely no privacy. Maybe two showers a year with permission 
One was a room set up for women. They took the children with many shower heads, and the other for men at a different time. So it was very hard to keep clean. I was covered with lice and um, all kinds of uh, terrible things with, um, with uh, different boils on my body, etc. Very hard to keep clean, and uh, first of all, with the bad nourishment, too. Next. Here are some of the beds we were uh, sleeping in. This picture was taken by the Russians after liberation. We had a tremendous typhus epidemic, couldn't go home right away. So your little cubby hole, that was your home. You lived in it, you slept in it, no table, no chair, nothing. Next. And these pumps, as I said, pumped the water, and they were very polluted, and many people got sick. This picture, again, was taken after liberation by the Russians. Nobody had a camera, nothing. Next. These little carts were used to bring the bread and to take away the bodies to the crematory. We had about 140,000 people between 41 and 45. We, uh, I was there from 42 to 45. The camp opened up late 41, mainly Czech people. Eventually, there would be Germans, Austrians, from Denmark even, but they were protected. The king said, you don't take my, you don't kill my Jews. They came from Holland, and the Danes were the only ones who were not sent out to Auschwitz. And so these brought uh, the bread ration once a week, not much. My mother would notch, put a notch in Monday to Tuesday, and then so forth. They went into next day's portion. Food was very, very important. You had no bread. It wasn't really good bread. They put all kinds of junk in it. Uh, but for us, I mean, it was food. Next. Three times a day, we had to stand in line. In fact, this again was taken after liberation. We couldn't leave yet. Your metal dish in hand. In the morning, you had uh, some black liquid, which was like a detergent. We cleaned our clothes with that, whatever clothes we still had, because the good stuff they took, they sent to Berlin from all our suitcases. We never saw anything again. So whatever they didn't want, uh, or somebody died, you wore those clothes. And so in, in lunch was maybe a turnip, turnip a little bit, the only vegetable I saw in those three years. No milk, nothing. A little potato, not a really good one. And some soup with some murky stuff floating in it. No meat at all, nothing. Maybe some little threads of horse meat. And that was at night, lunch, and that was three times a day, long lines to uh, wait online. And most of the people, when they got to the line, to the kettles where they gave it out, these barrels, they drank the food, the soup right down. They were so hungry by then. Next. What did we children do, especially young children like myself? Well, we rummaged around in the garbage dump, trying to find maybe a piece of potato peeling. You could still cut off a little piece, a rotten turnip, again, food, or a piece of string. Now, we had some slave labor there. Some women worked in the mica factory, a barrack set up for them. They had to splice. It looked like a stone, and that was used uh, in the war machinery. I had a friend who's a little bit older. She had to sew, uh, repair uh, uniforms from the Germans bull with bullet holes and so forth. That she had to fix those holes. I remember once they brought in uniforms and they had to be sprayed white. That was when they went into Russia. But we children um, were just running around trying to find some food. I was too young to do anything. Next. My mother worked as a so-called nurse in a geriatric room, all old women. I came there one morning. She never was a nurse before. She was a housewife. But they took her to work in, that was one of her jobs. One job was to wash typhus laundry or be in the cleaning contingent to clean up. Now, she uh, worked there a lot in the night so she could get an extra piece of bread, the night shift. Remember one morning I came there and the ladies had sticks in their hand. I said, what's going on? Turned out the night before, one of them fell something heavy on the shoulder. A rat was sitting there. The place was very filled up with vermin. 
Even I had a little box, a cardboard box for my dog at the head of my bed, a broken down box. One morning I see this shriveled up gray thing in there. I said, I didn't put that there. A mouse could even not find enough crumbs to live. Shriveled up dead mouse. Next. The worst that I can remember was on November 11th, 43. They said a count out had to be taken, that people were missing. They knew exactly how many people were there, always. But they made this bogus uh, uh, announcement, everybody out, even if you're sick, you have to go out of the camp, of course, with control, with the SS marching with you. We were in this ravine a few kilometers out of the camp, the only time I was out. And there were hills around it, and the SS were, the stormtroopers were standing there with guns pointed at us. It was a rainy day, they didn't shoot. Our feet sunk in the mud. We had no bath or no food all day. And somehow, at the end of the day, there was an order from Berlin, everybody back. And, but separate, men, women, and children, separate. We didn't want to do that. And we're holding on to each other for dear life. And one of the worst assessment, uh, his name was Heindel. He took his rifle butt and uh, beat my mother quite badly on that day. Yes, there were a few escapes, very, very few. And that made it very much worse for us because we got punished for that. I remember once they gave us soup only with black seeds in it, caraway seeds. To this day, I will not eat bread like rye bread with seeds, anything with seeds. I can't. That's the only thing I will not eat. It reminds me of those terribly bitter soups. And many people died on the field. It was a terrible day. Probably they had in mind either to shoot us on that day or send us all to Auschwitz or drown us. But somehow they didn't do it. I think some bad publicity came out to the outside world. I read later uh, that there was a broadcast on BBC. I can't uh, be sure about that totally. And that people are standing there, 40, 50,000, and perhaps will be shot. And uh, so they stopped that. Orders came from Berlin. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, to send us back. But I cannot be 100% sure. People, you know, sometimes make up stories too. Um, you know, it was always like that. We called them latrine talks. Somebody heard something. Oh, we are going to be free very soon. And by that time, we would have been free. They, they exaggerated what they heard. They heard a word, and then they exaggerated. Each person would tell the next person. By that time, we should have been home already. They call those latrine talks. So you have to be careful what you hear. Next. And that was the uh, worst day I remember. At the end, we'll have questions and answers. Uh, school was absolutely forbidden, but some heroic teachers taught us from memory. I know you've heard of some Czech children who had a very good teacher. The Czechs had a little better situation than we German children. We were in the minority. And uh, the German teenagers lived in one building, mainly the boys in another, and uh, they had clandestine uh, classes. We didn't have much of that. And my mother had a friend who knew a little bit of English, and my father found a little notebook in the garbage with a few good pages and a pencil. She taught me an English poem that she remembered. She was from Hamburg. And she taught me this poem, I wish I were a little bird up in a bright blue sky that flies and sings where he will, and no one asks him why. Now, I think the uh, penmanship is pretty good. I only had six months of schooling, and I think it's better than what I do today. Next. Now, you probably heard about the International Red Cross inspection, because terrorism was used as a sham to fool the world that nobody was being killed, that everything is fine. Yes, we are concentrated in a place, but we are living normal lives. So finally, the International Red Cross in 1944 requested to see a place like that, if that is true, that the people are being killed. And they chose terrorism for that. And not 
before they printed money, monopoly money, you couldn't buy anything with it, except some must have made you even more hungry. They set up signs to school, to playground, a little children's operator was played for them, soccer game, and all this was filmed. You can see that film on YouTube. Everybody's smiling. It's called The Führer Gives the Jews a City. It's, you can, it's free. You can look at it on YouTube. In fact, even some children got some sardine sandwiches, and they had to say, Uncle Ram. Ram was our last commandant. Oh, we have sardines again today. We want to play. Of course, it was wrong. It was not true. Uh, they ate them up so quickly that they had to replenish. They were so hungry. As what they didn't show them was, I mean, we weren't allowed to go to that area. They only showed them a very small area. It made people laugh and, and look. And only the people who looked halfway normal were shown to them. Next. What they didn't show them was the crematory. Now, from 140,000 people, two-thirds would be shipped out to the killing centers like Auschwitz, other camps too. One third, close to a third, died there. We were 15,000 children under the age of 15 among them. 1%, about 1% made it. I'm one of those very, very lucky children who made it. Um, and they went away. The International Red Cross not thinking any further. We want to see another area of the camp. No, only what they showed them, the propaganda. And they went away saying, oh, it's okay. They're not being killed. As soon as they were away, almost the whole camp was sent to Auschwitz. There was almost nobody left. They had a special selection among others for the disabled war veterans, highly decorated. One had a leg off, an arm off, heroes, war heroes. One had a hole in the head, and they had to go according to the alphabet to go to the uh, authorities there and to be uh, seen. And my father went together with my best friend. We shared a tiny room with this family from Berlin. They had a daughter exactly my age, two months older. Her name was Ruth. And her father walked with a limp. His father was actually half Jewish, the mother totally, and Ruth was brought up as a devout Christian. She never considered herself Jewish. And when they went to that inspection and, and to this uh, selection, uh, my father said he had to go to the lady with the typewriter, and the red circle was drawn around our name. We didn't know what it meant. And he asked my girlfriend's father, did you go there too? No, I didn't. And what was the result? They all went to Auschwitz. And I tell you something at the end about my best friend, Ruth. She died in the gas chamber before her 10th birthday. She gave me some of her doll's clothing. She said, you can give it back to me. You come to Berlin. She was from Berlin. I come from the Deep South. And of course, I couldn't do that. I gave all that to the Holocaust Museum. Next. We finally were liberated on May 8th, 1945, by the Russian army. There were just a few thousand people left in the camp. Some people came on death marches uh, from the camps that were still not liberated. Auschwitz was already liberated in January. We were uh, liberated in May, very far in May 8th. And they brought those people in because gas chambers were being built in Terrazin too. Eichmann ordered them. They were not complete, so they were never used. But that was, he had in mind to kill every single one of them. And finally, uh, on the night of May 8th, May 7th to 8th, I remember uh, the last few days during that time, there were blackened pieces of paper floating through the air. Uh, they were burning some records. And the trucks were moving out. You heard a lot of noise. I jumped one of the barricades. And just as I did that, all of a sudden, there was a tremendous explosion. And I felt for my head. I thought my head was off. They were throwing hand grenades. And as they were fleeing, we found uh, a cellar, a dark place in one of the buildings there. We didn't even know it existed. One person had a little candle. And about 10 minutes to 9, we walked, somebody walked up to see what's going on. He said, we're free, the Russians are here. 
but it wasn't like a jubilation. It was very muted because we knew by then that most of our families would not come back. It wasn't like, oh, yay, we are happy, now we can live again. No, it wasn't like that. We had a tremendous typhus epidemic at that time, and we couldn't go home right away. Finally, a, a bus came from Stuttgart to pick the few survivors up. As I told you, in our transfer of about 1,200, uh, where I was the youngest, by that time I'm 10 years old, there were about 13 survivors. A mother, father, and child, and a miracle alive and 10 others from that transport. Next. And see here some of the people from the, uh, the uh, forced transports from other camps. They were half dead when they came. Next. Very sick. And um, I will tell you now a, a little bit uh, what happened after the war, just a short synopsis. We went back to Germany. Of course, the house was occupied. They made a room for us. Uh, we owned the house. People were living in my grandparents' house. Never sold it by that time. And we decided, uh, my father um, decided to start his business again. We moved to a nice apartment. I started school. I didn't know where I belonged, fourth grade, fifth grade. Well, I had never finished my first grade. What we decided, we want to go uh, to America because President Truman, God rest his soul, let us come in as displaced persons. And we were in the second boat that uh, came to the shores. In fact, I looked it up. It was in the papers. Miracle ship comes in. And we went to my aunt and uncle. My mother had a brother in America who was fighting in World War II in Anzion Casino. He came back from the war. It was very crowded in a small apartment. And my parents got a job uh, as a cook as a couple, and, uh, and my father, the uh, a waiter and so forth, uh, in this house uh, on the estate. And I got a terrible cough. And there was a girl in the camp who got a little bit more food. And, I, and we were told, don't go near her. She's very sick. You will catch it. It's a terrible disease. I prayed to God. I said, I want to have a little more food. Can't be so serious. And the lady uh, of that estate, she said, well, I don't like how she's coughing. She took me to the doctor, and of course he said immediately she has to be hospitalized. Uh, I knew I was sick in the camp already, but it was uh, not that bad. And later, of course, it became worse. I had tuberculosis, as many children did. But my case was very bad in both lungs. And they sent me to a public hospital. I, we didn't have any money an award for two years in bed. There was no cure at that time. Finally, my parents took me out. They had an apartment by then in Brooklyn, a three or third floor walk up, and still no school, nothing. And finally, I was really sick. I was hemorrhaging by that time. And a drug was discovered, streptomycin. After penicillin came streptomycin, a miracle drug. First drug ever against tuberculosis. And it was given to me on an experimental basis, two very painful shots a day. And I got better very quickly. And uh, still no school. And finally, I uh, got sick again. And then the new drugs came, um, INH, PAS. Some of them I still use today. 26 pills a day. I was sick from morning to night and two shots of streptomine, very painful shots for a whole year, but they cured me for that time. And then I started high school at age 15, the first time in my life that I could really go to school, and I was so happy. I dressed up like going to a ball the first day. I remember I had a green corduroy skirt and a red vest and a white uh, blouse. And I was so nervous that I was perspiring and the red went straight. I ruined my whole white blouse. Remember my first day of school. And there was a girl sitting next to me, Lucy Perpy, who uh, I, I didn't have any friends. And I said to her, would you like to go to the movies with me? She said, sure. So again, I dressed up to the hilt to go to a regular movie. I didn't know how to behave. 
So I finished high school in three instead of four years, we're going to summer school. I didn't want to be 19 years old to graduate or to be the oldest. So I graduated 18, started college. I wanted to be a doctor by then. I knew I was going to major in chemistry or science. And I was a few weeks in, uh, in school, and again, I had to drop out. I was sick again. I had a kind of a nice summer and dancing and not eating well, and the whole thing came back again. Again, a whole year in bed, and 26 pills a day, two shots of streptomycin. And then, of course, I got better, and since then, I'm totally cured. And I met the man, one of the really wonderful things of my life was to meet the co-discoverer of the antibiotic streptomycin, Albert Chats. Waxman got the Nobel Prize, but his student did all the work. At 23, he discovered streptomycin at Rutgers University. We wrote a book together and a film. And it was a wonderful feeling to put my arm around this man to say, thank you for saving my life in Philadelphia in the Greyhound stop. Well, I worked for 38 years in medical research, clinical work for some very famous uh, uh, chemists and so forth, medical research. And I really wanted to become a doctor. It's another story. I had an acceptance in Heidelberg, and they were singing a Nazi song. I said, no, nah, I'm not staying here. I was ready to start. Well, I, just, I regretted that. But anyhow, some years ago, it's almost over. Don't worry. You're almost released. Anyway, I went, just a minute. Some years ago, I went for the first time back to Europe, and I wanted to see my life. Is it true that I went through this? Couldn't be. It's a dream, but I went through. No, can you go back one, please? Um, Terrazin is 60 kilometers north of Prague. Next. And I went through the same gate that I did in 1942. It looked the same still. Next. And I found the house where we were lived, still very dirty. But today, the whole town has been rebuilt. I cannot even recognize it anymore. It was divided into two portions, the big ghetto, they call the ghetto uh, concentration camp, and the small fortress, the big fortress and the small one. Small one was a prison for the prison. If you drew some pictures the way it really looked, you were taken there and killed. It was a terrible place. Next. And here, the uh, street we lived on, the train street, from here the trains went straight to Auschwitz. Next. And the crematory, uh, there was a mayor there, there's a mayor again. Um, and I was told, don't take any pictures. The Russians were still occupying that area, but I did anyway. Next. Here's the crematory ovens, uh, four ovens. And I was told it's one of the best preserved uh, the crematories in the whole, all of, in all of the camps. You, it's total. Next. And many people go there. It's a memorial today. Red uh, flowers depicting blood. Thousands upon thousands go to see the place. Even one of our first ladies was there, Mrs. Bush. And then I went also back to my mother's hometown to thank the people who helped us, who came in the middle of the night bringing us maybe a chicken, uh, a loaf of bread, to thank them. And there's one more picture. Uh, to me, it's my second hero. Next, please. Grave of our beloved Teresa. Teresa was my grandmother's maid for 30, 20, uh, over 20, 25 years or so. And she kept some of the pic two photo albums. That's why you saw pictures. You're probably wondering, where did she get all those pictures from? She put them in the basement. She saved our prayer books, which were very important to us. A few knickknacks. And she could have gotten killed for that. She was not going to be just a bystander. And put them in her basement. She came in the middle of the night to do that. And then when we came back, I said, we're going to Teresa. I said, Teresa is no longer alive. And she, when the Americans came to that part of Germany, they knocked on the doors. She didn't open right away. And the soldier shot through the door, killing her instantly. So if there's a heaven, there are two women walking hand in hand, one killed by a Nazi bullet, the other the product of war. And i still very good friends with her great-grandchildren even. They became family. Now, there's only one little more So She is my second hero, the lady with the bread and Teresa. 
and I'll be forever grateful to both people as long as I live. And I always wanted to find out some family members for my girlfriend, Ruth, or a picture. There must be somebody who knows something. And I'm, I, last ditch effort, I looked for at least 30 years. I go, went to the internet. There was a German paper, the Tagesspiegel, online. They have a paper also, a real paper, big uh, paper in Berlin. And I wrote to the editor, who has a picture, can you please help me, of Ruth Nellie Abraham? Two people answered me, out of the blue. One was an American journalist, he wanted the story, he didn't know anything. The other one was a genealogist, and she started to dig into her family, and lo and behold, she found some cousins. And one of them had a picture of Ruth when she was maybe three, four years old, and I will share that with you right now. That's the only thing that is left of this child. I take it everywhere now. That was Ruth. And one day, I was thinking at my kitchen table when I was writing uh, my first book, I'm a star. By the way, it doesn't mean I'm a Jewish star. I'm a movie star. I always did want to be a movie star. But anyway, I think all girls did. And I'm turning this negative symbol of the yellow star into something positive that every human to me is a star. Now, I'm sitting at my kitchen table and writing a poem, and I'd like to end this program with this poem. And I was thinking, how did she feel as she walked with her mother into the gas chamber? Because the mothers took the children, the men were separate. And the mother is still trying to uh, you know, protect the child, give the child hope. And I called it, hold me tight. Come with me, my child. Hold my hand. Be calm, my child. Do not try to understand. Don't be afraid, my child. Walk with pride. You know your mother is here at your side. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. Mother is giving hope to her child. No, no, don't look at the chimneys. See the blue sky. My arm is around to protect you. Don't cry. Come close, let the blows fall on me. There'll be a day when again we'll be free. Hold me tight, day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light, still hope. Give all your belongings to them, quickly undress. One day soon we will again have happiness. Sleep, my child, I have no more to give. Oh God! Oh, God, we're not going to live. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Hold me tight. Thank you. So we don't. No, it's okay. Yeah, okay. We can put it here. Okay, please yell it out loud. Good. Okay.
Well, well, look, <laughs> I think without humor, you have almost nothing. I mean, I'm not going to stand here in front of you and uh, and cry. I I survived it. I'm the hero of this. I made it, and I became a productive person. And that is more important to get out of something, not to feel, uh, to make you feel sorry for me. No, I lived a nice life. It, I didn't get married, but uh, that's something. It's another story. Okay, some stupid idiots who. All right, I picked the wrong people. All right, whatever. Anyway, um, we really didn't talk about it very much at home. And certainly, I don't want you to feel pity for me. Uh, I became a productive person because I wanted, I fought like a devil. My life after the war, for me, it was quite even worse because I was older, I understood things. I was fighting for my life all over again, and it was quite a challenge to be in hospitalized and and not have no friends and nothing but i didn't we didn't do very much of talking my parents never really gave an interview we did later on make a few films with my mother she really didn't want it in 1981 there was a first world gathering of jewish holocaust survivors in jerusalem and i've always been writing i mean that's something i could do i didn't need to have any strength so when i was sick i could write I wrote little poems. My mother was a good poet, too. Little, you know, greeting card poet. That's me. Anyway, I wrote a poem, and I gave it to a friend of mine in the hospital. Actually, we weren't friends at that time. I got to know her. I met her in the ladies' dressing room. The operating room was on the same uh, floor as my laboratory. And she was talking about she does these gigs, and she sings. I came out, and I said... Oh, uh, can you compose? I hear you're a singer. She said, sure, I can compose. Can I give you a poem? Maybe you can do something. This is for a very large meeting in Jerusalem. She said, give it to me. Within one day, she came up with a wonderful song and became the only original song presented in Jerusalem, 1981, for the first world gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors. And was really great because a Christian and a Jew did this together. That was very important to me. She was Catholic, Italian background. And then I decided it's time to write a book because I always wanted to write my story. And I started to write with little poems, a little history. And I had a job. I mean, I worked many weekends. I mean, there was not that much time. And um, I had the good fortune. I mean, I elbowed myself in very hard without an agent. Agent told me in 1984, you should have done this 15 years ago. I said, oh, screw you, excuse me. <laughs> I'll find a way to do this. I made eight copies of uh, Xerox copies. The worst one I gave to Simon & Schuster because they said they weren't interested. They did a book on that topic. But I said, please, please let me bring it to you. No, you can leave it with the reception. No, 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 no. And I showed them all the publicity we had with the song. And, uh, well, anyway, the bottom line was they took it. They, it came out in hard and soft cover. And today it is, uh, it's not with Penguin. It's a scholastic book in eight language, And uh, it became a classic. I've written five other books besides What Happened After the War, Beyond the Yellow Star, and then the trequel, uh, the story with Dr. Schatz, who saved my life. And uh, he was cheated of the Nobel Prize. And long, we have a film on it. Some of the, we have quite a few films on these things. And but, um, I am, you know, I am the conqueror. I'm not going to look back and say, well, they didn't get me. Even the bug, this little stinking little microbe, didn't get me because I wouldn't let it. Uh, if Hitler didn't get me, even that microbe didn't get me. So what's the use of being a sad sack? Look, I don't laugh on the, uh, on the graves of, um, uh, of my ancestors, for sure not. Neither will I forgive the people who did this. I know there are people, especially one person, I'm not mentioning her, she forgives everybody. I do not. The ones who killed, 
who were the actual killers, I can never forgive, but I do believe in reconciliation. And I had a talk just the other day, thank God for the cell phone, you know, iPhone, you can talk free of charge with Messenger. Uh, it's amazing, we found, I found that out. Uh, some, I have a new friend in Sicily, she calls me every day for an hour. Already she uh, has texted me here, she had spaghetti for lunch. Okay, good. <laughs> Pasta. I said, fine, and how she makes it. And every day she be in contact with each other. And I had this conversation with a good friend of mine. He was vacationing in, at Istanbul. A whole hour on the phone, free. Well, God bless them. Anyway, uh, to him, he said, what you are doing is so much more important. To say forgive, that's the past. We know what happened. But to reconcile, to become friends again, and I do speak in Germany a lot. Every year I go there, at least once. I speak German perfectly still. And um, to teach the young people, of course, when I come into a group like this, uh, in many schools, hundreds and hundreds of kids come, I tell them right away because they feel guilty, and they say, here it goes again. She's going to say, we're all Nazis. I said, look, uh, I don't come here to blame you for what happened, for what your grandparents did. But I want, I reach out my hand to you in friendship, that such things will never happen again, and we must learn from history. So we're on a different level. So for me, reconciliation is very important, very important. To me, that's more important than saying, I forgive you. Ah, it's like saying, I love you, and you really don't mean it. Those are just words. And I think those crimes can only be forgiven by somebody higher, God not for humans. I know in the Christian faith, I wrote a book also with a Polish Catholic girl. Uh, she was in labor camps for two years with her parents. She said, I'm a Catholic, I'm a devout Catholic. I have to forgive. I said, I'm Jewish, I, it's a little different. If it is premeditated murder, and I've had many discussions about this, premeditated murder and saying, I'm gonna kill you, does it? Only the person who was killed can forgive, so there is no forgiveness. Certainly it's personal, but does that change history? Uh, just to say I forgive you? Nothing, nothing has changed, but uh, reconciliation can change history. Yes, please, yes. Yes. Well, of course, <laughs> we weren't very good here either. For instance, Roosevelt sent a boat back um, to St. Louis. I have a friend who was on that boat. She was about two years old. And uh, it was in first to Cuba. They wouldn't take them. And then they were in the Miami Harbor. Sent them back to Europe. And all, many of them were uh, sent to camps afterwards. Many. How do we explain that? You know, I think it's a guilt for everybody. Roosevelt wasn't such a great guy at that time. Yes, they were under pressure, bringing in more immigrants. We, we had an uncle in, the, in New York, a brother of my grandmother, my father's side. He had a big ceramics business. My mother called him up right after Crystal night. Uncle, can you help us? He, and I saw him many years later. He used to give out these dishes, Yadro and so forth. The price is right. For that, he had money. Wild ceramics. So he said to my mother, what do you want to do? Add more to the unemployment. We have a lot of unemployment here. Wouldn't help. Nothing. Fortunately, many people, even Americans, didn't want to help. Are they guilty? Especially the higher-ups? Yes, they are guilty. Yes. I mean, Roosevelt, you know, was adored and everything. Eleanor was a nice person. I saw her once speaking uh, at my co um, college. But look, that's how it was. Yeah. Anybody else? Please. Yes. Yeah, well, that was a friend of mine, a Polish man from Warsaw. He ran away from the Warsaw Ghetto and spent his time in Siberia. 
And he wrote, he was an artist. He was actually a dental technician, but he was a primitive artist. He made big murals. And he wrote a book also, The Holocaust Through the Eyes of an Artist. It was quite a little bit uh, problematic, but it won a first prize in Germany for, uh, for the uh, young, younger adults, uh, younger children. And uh, the year later, mine was on the uh, finalist for the award, but of course, this book was a finalist in the German version. And uh, I, they weren't going to give it twice the same subject, but he was quite a very good artist who made them for. He saw pictures by my poems. Originally, they were, I call it epic rhyme. Children don't want to read uh, 18 pages if you can do it in 18 lines. But now they, uh, even adults like to read it because I put them, and then when I went to Simon Schuster, they said, look, we like what you did. Uh, you have to have history in it. So I went and got 18 books, took out what I thought was important, and I uh, minimized everything, you know, put it into two, three pages. You get the whole story of history. Very important to have history. And uh, it's after 20 years, it's still very much in print. Right now it's in the 35th printing by Penguin, and a very good relationship with my publisher, which is the head of the department. And it is a play now. And I perhaps we can even, if you have a, a, a group here who can do it, it's called The Star on My Heart. It was done in Ohio, in two cities. I went there a whole week, and now it's being done again in the Akron area. We have to get it into different cities to be able to get it to a publisher to publish it like dramatic publishing who do uh, plays like that. I hope it will work out. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Wow, that was only in one camp. The tattoo was only in one camp in Auschwitz as a registration mark. And at the end, when the Hungarians came, they came in one swoop just before the war ended. Um, they didn't even, not all of them got tattoos. I have a number, yeah, it's tattooed on my heart. Uh, that was the only place, the tattoo. Thank you. Yeah, if anybody, I have more books. If you need them, I'll be happy to uh, sign them for you. You could use them in your, if your teachers use them uh, in your school. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish you the best. We need scientists.